Geico presents oh, yet another voicemail from your roommate. Hi. So, about the kitchen. Turns out when there's a grease fire, you're not supposed to throw water on it. <laughs> Who would have known, right? Anyways, the fire department is here and it's totally cool. Give me a call back when you get a chance. The Geico Insurance Agency could help keep your personal property protected, like if danger is your roommate's middle name. Visit Geico.com to see how easy it is to switch and save on renter's insurance. Welcome to Audio Gyan with Kedar Nimkar, a podcast that documents insightful conversations with Indian designers, artists, musicians, writers, thinkers and creatives of all types. Catch us on iTunes or visit audiogyan.com for more Gyan sessions. Here's your host Kedar Nimkar. Today I have Ashwini Deshpande with us on Audio Gyan, co-founder and director of Elephant Design Studio in Pune and Singapore. She is a 1989 graduate of NID Ahmedabad. She is a designer, mentor, jury and active founding member of ADI. You can find most of her work and a huge body of uh, all the projects she has done online and a lot of interviews documented online. But today we are here to discuss more about her design philosophy. So thank you Ashwini for giving your time and it's a real honor to have you on audio again. Thank you Kedar. It's it's absolutely wonderful to be talking to you. Yeah. Uh and I'm hoping to have a conversation which is slightly more philosophical uh, okay. because uh, uh, I've seen uh, I've been like I've been following your work for quite some time and I've seen that you've started almost 30 years back which I'll speak about uh, in the later half sure. but uh, you also uh, are active in communicating your design philosophies and ideologies to the new age designers sure. as well so that's where I have come up with this topic called new and old school design okay uh and let's see where we go uh and obviously you must have answered and even i have heard your answers uh, online on youtube saying what's your design philosophy so i don't want to get into that okay uh but i want to ask you a slightly more abstract question which is what are the parameters uh what parameters your definition of design has been changing on what parameters right i mean uh if you can give us a brief walk through Yeah, these okay. were the few okay. key elements on which you gauge your work other work uh, work happening in the society at large and sure. those parameters in general sure so you know as uh, as we all have been seeing design is the most uh, misunderstood misused abused word uh, having something designer used to be this quote unquote word uh, many years ago uh, for people who would do just an outside change a cosmetic change into something and say we have a designer range coming out uh, but i think my uh, journey and it's been really a long journey yes uh, 30 years i hope it doesn't mean old school it just means the years mm-hmm. uh, which is just a number uh, my my twist with design i think was uh, when i was a kid and my first memory of anything which is called design is is a very colorful patterned curtain inside my house Mm-hmm. and it seems as a kid as a toddler i used to be uh, i used to giggle when i looked at that curtain and i suppose uh, the colors or the pattern or the texture did something to my senses right so i could feel it touch it look at it feel good about it and i don't think that basic understanding of what design does to a person uh, really changes over the years so if there is a design designed object or service or product or experience anything at all all that it is supposed to do is uh, it make it more approachable make it more accessible make people feel good about it delighted about it make something easy than it used to be before so i think all that is very much there and there is this uh, very simple filter that you know does it work and does it look good and if you have no on any one of those then maybe you have to revisit what you're doing so i think it's not a big philosophy it's very simple Mm-hmm. and sometimes we use this uh, very english word in our studio which is prettyfy mm-hmm. okay so sometimes uh, you get a project that lands up uh, asking just prettyfication and as designers with experience we know we can do much more right so uh, we have this bug so we would go back to the project and say is that all we can do what if we did this as well and what if we did that as well and interestingly uh, no client who is g- coming with her project is going to refuse doing something better right mm-hmm. i mean even if the ask of the project is just make it look good 
if you're adding many other things to it, uh, nobody's going to say no to it. It's just that designers sometimes fail to push that boundary and sort of feel satisfied that I've done it, I've achieved it, I've removed all the pain points, now what else? Uh, so I think what has changed really over the years is if I were to start at something from an outside, like a skin, uh, my understanding of design in my early years as a design student, as I was just beginning to learn anything formally, was that uh, design is is kind of a last layer, mm. you know, which is the cosmetic layer, which makes things look good, uh, attractive. Uh, and of course, uh, people like to possess those. Aesthetics is the result. Yeah. Absolutely, the aesthetics. And then slowly you start moving towards the core. And then slowly you realize, no, it can't just look good. It has to work well. It has to work better than it used to before. And for that, what do you need to do? You need to change a few things. You need to probably change the way you're looking at the whole problem itself. And then the next layer, which is really the core, which is the experience. Has the whole experience become better? So it's not just the first layer of looking good, second layer of you know, working better. The third layer is, is it changing something for good? Is it making a bigger difference at the core itself? And then once you make that bigger difference at the core, how it looks becomes kind of incidental. You know, it falls in place. How it works falls in place. Mm. If you've taken care of the core of making a positive difference to anything that you're handling. So I think that is what probably has been the journey. And now it's like we say design is a way of life. Mm. So anything that we are doing, are we looking at who is it intended for? What is the consequence of what I'm doing? And is that a good consequence or not a desirable consequence? So, yeah, from aesthetics, patterns, colors to, you know, life itself, I think that has been the change in how I look at design. Mm -hmm. I have actually two uh, points here and if you can elaborate more on sure. that. So one is uh, how and when did we as humans realize that design is more than aesthetics, right? And second is, is it an inherent quality or we... So only prettification is a really intense... You're using the word well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, is it really... I, I assume that it's a more intangible thing. So sure. to bring tangibility, to bring more credibility to what you're doing, how yeah. you're adding yeah. value, the new layer is added or is it inherent? So actually this is the first question. And if it's inherent, then how did we explore or discover this? Uh, so discover what? Meaning the core of it or yeah, yeah. the outer layer? Uh, no, the inner layer. So Because I, I'm very sure we can go to a hammer as a basic example. Yes, absolutely. But, I mean, yeah, hammer was the first thing or the, the cave paintings that happened. But they didn't happen for art. I think the cave paintings happened for storytelling. You know, people who lived in that age wanted to tell a story about how they lived. Mm -hmm. And the way they expressed it was through those uh, figurines, right? Those figures that they drew on their walls, which we can see even now. Uh, so I think the, the, the aim was not prettification. The aim was to tell a story. And I think that's a, that's a beautiful inspiration for anyone who's trying to do anything which is visual. Because I'm a communication designer, visual communication designer. And a lot of times we are asked questions like, can graphic design really make a difference? Mm -hmm. And I think that that example is what we really need to refer to then because uh, the caveman was trying to tell a story and they, the, the man or the woman did tell the story very effectively. We look at it even today after thousands of years and we know what story it was, what, how were they living, what was their you know, community structure, how were they eating, who were they killing and so on. And we know the story even today because they tried to tell the story. It's not about their art or their skill of drawing a human figure with perfect proportions. Mm -hmm. So then you realize that the message or the story is far more important and visual design is a medium to express it. Mm -hmm. So then your expression could be really pretty, but if you don't have the content, if you have no story to tell, mm -hmm. then it sort of falls short of a lot of other things. Then it falls to fails to engage. And the whole point of design, if anybody were to experience design and benefit from it, the person first needs to engage with it. Mm -hmm. So for engaging, the prettification works and I think that it has its own place. So I'm not denying that a skill of prettification is of no use. That's, that's great to engage or mm -hmm. hold somebody's attention or stop somebody and notice something. But beyond that, if it's not telling you a message, not telling you a story which is 
meaningful to you or relevant to you which is the core really then it's going to fail to do what it's supposed to do mm-hmm. so i think there is a balance so as you reach the inner core you probably hone your skills of telling a better story or finding a better story to tell I think that's the core then. Mm-hmm. So form follows function is just. Oops, no, 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 no. We no. won't get there. <laughs> no, no. I'm just saying it is just a better articulation, but inherently we are doing that. We are knowingly or unknowingly. We are, we are. That's true. And I mean, I come from the school, and we come from the country where function is of utmost importance. Mm. I mean, we are not really in the space where we'll be probably designing. aesthetics of skateboards and stuff you know we are actually are in our country the the majority of the population is struggling to get their basic functionalities met mm. so if we can't make a comfortable chair i mean we have really failed then right mm. because the same plastic can make a comfortable chair as well and an uncomfortable one mm. the same plastic can make a stackable chair and a non stackable one right sure. so i think if we fail to do this functionality then mm. in india really we have no place and i come from i mean if you were to call me old school then that is what i come from that every design must have a purpose correct correct in fact this naturally segues into my next question uh, yeah. and this is mainly uh, you speak at various events conferences work, you take workshops and a lot of other things so yeah. uh, again it could be my observation but i wanted to generally ask you that I recently attended Design Up, mm-hmm. and I also attended PDF. Yeah, uh, and these are just two instances, not sure. really in particularly those two festivals or uh, conferences. But what I've observed is, uh, as I'm getting deeper into uh, the art and the design industry mm-hmm. of India through audio again, I've observed there are two schools, right? Mm-hmm. One which is exploring and pushing the boundaries in terms of tech. Mm-hmm. So at some conferences, you will see a lot of people speaking about animation and right um how do you push the envelope of uh products like yeah. uber and ola and mm-hmm. swiggy mm-hmm. and on the other side uh these idc or nid type schools uh they are trying to go to a much more grassroots level mm. so i'm sure as a designer i feel enriched if i get both the worlds sure. but uh, for a designer what would be your uh not a tip but whatever yeah. you call it yeah. Uh, how do you they um, enrich themselves by living both, or maybe just pros and cons of sure, both the sides? Sure. So I think first of all, anything at all in India, if it is bringing the designer community together and making them into a voice, it's most welcome. Whether it is from the technology side, or it is from the skill side, or it is from thought side. or it is just from having fun i mean if there is just a beer mixer where designers come together and do and do a meaningful conversation even that is great because i think we first of all this is a young profession secondly it's a it's a very very limited profession by the number of people who are in it so for the longest time india just had two design institutes i mean when i went to nid they used to take 25 people in one batch and we are a country of a billion people and if we have to make a difference if a profession any profession if it has to make a difference in the country in the community in the society it needs some uh, basic mass right some number some mm. critical mass mm. and if we remain scattered we never come together talk about what we can do how our profession can make a difference or what we want from anybody else so that our profession can do better uh, we'll never get there mm. so i am extremely happy that there are more conferences happening you know somebody last year was saying that oh in bangalore there are too many conferences happening but i think i i love that actually mm. because you know make designers come together that's the only way they can figure what the others are doing and that's the only way how we we will know how we can impact anything at all so coming back to the specific two conferences that you spoke about i think what's interesting in both of them and you know content obviously is different and as you're rightly uh, saying it's one is tech centered and another is probably more thought or conceptual uh, centered but what is interesting in both these and i think that's a format that works for a professional like ours is they are very interactive so it's not like a speaker comes and one way delivers a talk and goes away hmm. in both these conferences there are a lot of interactive sessions so people get a chance to speak to each other they get a chance to ask questions to speakers they get a chance to be up close with anybody who's anybody in that profession 
who's who or whatever the rock stars we don't have really any rock stars in design yet but mm. whoever are on their way you get to meet them and you get to see what they're doing how they're thinking and i think that format is what is really interesting and that should remain whether it is done by design up or it is done by curious or it is done by the of course the pune design festival which started 14 years ago uh and or it is done by cii anybody at all who's getting designers together i think it's it's is great as long as it remains interactive because otherwise we can you know watch youtube videos of talks and that's the same yeah. value as well as sitting in an audience and not interacting with the speaker yeah. uh, i also believe and as a design school we had a lot of this that you learn a lot from your peers mm. so it's not just your professors who teach you the five years of nid that i went through but i think we learned a lot from a batch senior a batch junior my batch and so on i think that also happens at these conferences and i i see a lot of that happening at both design up as well as pdf that people are looking forward to meeting other people mm-hmm. and discussing things so i think more the merrier i mean mm-hmm. let the design community get together and do something mm. no but i don't know i i keep swinging between this classic school versus the new age uh you know that it's not new age anymore it's already yeah. you know whatever 10 years or whatever no i mean let me put it this way because uh, i was there in one of the panel discussions and one of the speakers said that we have solved most of the problems yes right? i i remember this yes yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, i was on the other side saying boss we have not even scratched the surface yet right so there is this say ag rao who's working in the craft business yes. it was a whole new world for me right True. and True. then people living in kashmir and yes. how are those handy uh, handicraft people yeah. are being empowered to create so there like for me the design canvas is just suddenly widened and it is now it become almost infinite that right. i can comprehend right. so if you can highlight what are the domains uh, where design needs maximum impa- uh, mm-hmm. where design needs maximum attention hmm. and secondly then uh, which can really bring impact to the masses sure so in reality design can actually impact positively to anything at all uh, you can apply design thinking to most uh, domains verticals technologies services everything at all but i think we have a very acute problem rising in india and and many of us uh, experience this very much within our homes as well we have elderly people in our homes and uh, we see them struggling with their devices and phones and you know even furniture and various other things and uh, i believe in i mean the year i was born i believe the life expect- expectancy was less than 50 in india and i think today it is about 70 so in the 50 odd years of my life i've seen it growing by 20 plus years which means it's going to grow further so we're going to have a really large aging population in a country that has absolutely no systems set for elderly population there is nothing made friendly for them i mean if i was to be i mean i don't know how i'll be when i'm i'm 70 or 75 but if i was to come to the studio which is not accessible so there is nothing that's built for the elderly in india so i think the impact of design will be largest in the coming years if designers are able to focus on making lives easier for the elderly Mm. and uh, at elephant we have taken some steps as well on this uh, so last year we were looking at the, exactly the question you asked we said what is the area where we can impact the most and nobody is coming forward and giving us projects in that area mm. uh, which also means that most of the commercial organizations have neglected the power of what elderly can do for them or power of what they can do for the elderly you know mind you this uh, middle class elderly population even has spending power huge spending power but they are neglected uh, so we started looking at what is it that we can do for the elderly and it's it's much easier said than done because uh, we had to talk to dozens of elderly people to even understand what are the areas in which we could make an impact it's very easy to say let me design something for the elderly but what do you design you know what is it that they really want because i again heard a very recent statistics that 50% of the startups fail because people didn't need that idea mm. so we didn't want to be doing something that people don't need so we really want to understand what they need and then we classify it into various aspects of their life uh, aspects of uh, you know some things are entertainment some things are community some things are about 
feeling lonely some things are about functionality of objects and then we started building ideas around it and uh, well we are just on the way we have not yet reached anywhere but there are all kinds of ideas that are needed for them so i think this is one space hmm. not to forget of course uh, people with disabilities hmm. in india i think it's the most difficult life for a person who has even one faculty less and nothing is built or made for that person i'm going to go a step further and tell you that this world is designed for an average uh, 5 feet 6 inches 55 kg sorry 65 kg male white male mm-hmm. okay the whole world is designed for them mm-hmm. it's not designed for anybody else so all the ergonomic proportions the air conditioning temperature that is considered a norm which is what over 22 23 degrees is actually set for that that middle aged that height weight white male mm mm-hmm. so it's no wonder that many of us feel uncomfortable in those temperatures because the world is not built for us the tread of the steps that we came from is also built for that male okay mm-hmm. so the world needs to be designed being inclusive so there's so much to do i mean i don't know who says that everything is done you know mm-hmm. there is so much to do yeah okay interesting <laughs> It's a man. It just yeah, keeps, it's it's, it's, it's mind boggling, right? Yeah, the yeah. world is just not designed for everybody. Mm-hmm. So let's start. <laughs> In fact, the day before yesterday, for elections, I had gone to the camp where the election okay. was happening, and there were steps, and yeah. the steps were quite inclined, and uh, there was a ramp just yes. put for a wheelchair. Yes. But the ramp, like at at I least know. two people yeah. need to push. Someone. I know exactly what you mean. I experienced yeah. the exact same yeah. thing. Yes, yeah. it's very bad. I believe, like at least I've been to Singapore. Singapore is like most accessible. It is very country. accessible. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Ashwini, I want to just uh, go back uh, mm-hmm. because this conversation is leading to elephant and uh, more about it. But I'll come in the last part of uh, the conversation for this. Sure. Um, can you tell us like few milestones in the Indian design landscape? uh which is disrupted impacted or any other thing in the last 3 decades because that's your uh that's the time karma bhumi you know it's it's not just my karma bhumi it's it's indian designs karma bhumi because mm. we are the oldest largest multidisciplinary design company india has mm-hmm. there were a lot of others who started but somewhere along the way didn't really sustain so that's unfortunate and i will always say this that we need a 100 design companies of our scale at least if nothing more mm-hmm. more is welcome because we learn from that how to scale up we don't know how to scale up beyond a certain point but uh so yeah so these three decades have been interesting because uh, when we started i don't think there was anything called business of design mm. okay so it's hard to believe today but in 1989 when we would quote somebody a thing called design fees invariably they would get back to us and say we understand everything else on your fee proposal which is you know number of prints or visit fees or anything at all travel material costs mock ups everything what is this component called design fees mm-hmm. we have never paid this before so from a time where our time was not valued at all to a time where we i'm sitting here and talking to you about 30 years right mm-hmm. so i think it's it's um it's really come a long way and i won't say you know we were the only ones who made it happen but i think a large part of it changed when india sort of in the late 90s started getting a little more liberalized towards businesses uh so in the early years let's say 4 5 years of elephant we sort of managed to survive because expectations were really low we were happy if we just got a project you know no matter what the fees were uh also fortunately for us our first project was really large so we managed to survive but after this liberalization what really happened is indian businesses could go outside mm-hmm. and sell their goods and mncs would come to india and sell their goods that's really what happened right in simple words mm-hmm. and the moment indian goods sat next to foreign goods uh you could see the difference in various parameters uh number one was of course the manufacturing quality but the other one was or the fit and finish but the other one was the design itself you know the indian conglomerates had really not invested in making their products better 
because they had no need to because they were competing a similar somebody who had not invested in design mm-hmm. so as a consumer or a user or a customer the choice was limited to non design products so you choose one or the other they were non design they were not meant to be user friendly convenient etc they were meant to do a job mm-hmm. and probably it was all right in that time because india was learning to manufacture mm-hmm. right but the moment this happened there was a there was a dire need of differentiation and improvement mm. and that's when people started to realize that if you design something better you know there is a better chance of selling here as well as selling outside and i think that's what sort of was a big turning point for indian design mm. so whoever was already there and we happened to already be there really benefited from that uh, the other thing that happened is these uh, many of these mncs who came to india they started selling everything that they had in their other markets as is within india and that fascination of imported or multinational companies goods stayed for a little while for a few years but you know as we say in india we are like this only so there is only certain thing that we will accept from outside cultures mm. but there are certain things that need to be aligned to the way we are the way we live the way we eat you know so and yet being more adaptive yes yeah. we are adaptive absolutely yeah. but we still want you know if you go back home you'll still eat the kind of food you ate 20 years ago as well so we don't change a lot of those things if you look at the weddings not much has changed in the rituals mm-hmm. i mean it's only grown bigger in fact the pomp and show has grown bigger uh, so there are few very basic things that we don't change i think india is also one of the few countries where despite globalization women still wear indian wear mm-hmm. you will not find that anywhere in any of the asian countries that have gone through a similar journey uh, barring let's say pakistan or sri lanka or bangladesh just this uh, this contingent of mm. countries everywhere else they are just wearing formal western clothes so what is it that is not you know we have not changed why mm. there are few things we are not willing to change because we like them they are comfortable for us there is a limbic imprint that we don't want to let go mm. so so the mnc started realizing that our products and services will not be fully adopted or loved by indians unless we do some change some alignment with what indians want the way they live the way they perceive things and so on which was another great turning point for indian design because then who was ready to do it who would be the right people to do it and some of the mncs tried bringing you know their agencies from other countries you know overseas and you know trying to get them to get insights in india and design for india and so on but that didn't work well either hmm. is that the time when mac alu tikki came in <laughs> uh, probably yeah. is that the time when mac came in and realized that oh in india hmm. we might have to do an outlet with just vegetarian food mm-hmm. i mean the only one in the world right yeah so absolutely that's the time when people started acknowledging hmm. that we can't just come with whatever we have and hope to sell in india mm. and so this adopting to indian culture adopting or aligning products and services to india is when again design came in the forefront mm. because those companies were mature companies as far as design is concerned they knew the value of design mm. they had used design in other countries so all now they had to do is use design in india and from indian designers if possible mm. and again we were you know whoever was at the right time right place again could see the whole shift uh that was the second one i think large turning point and the third one is in the recent times uh which is the technology social so media so in india no even before that okay. social media of course has you know it, it's exploded and done few things that we didn't ever imagine will happen but little before that uh indian it industry had created a good name for itself mm-hmm. so people were far more perceptive you know there was far more acceptance to what india was doing in terms of technology so i think that is another thing that uh, benefited a lot of indian designers who were working in the space of maybe animation special effects uh, you know apps and all of the world that uh, that's going on right net now net banking net banking oh yes i think yeah. india has played a big role in that and yeah. i believe all the big banks in the world have their uh, centers working in india yeah. so all of that happened and i think it did some uh, good you know carving the road for mm. indian design as well so that's the third big change i would say mm-hmm. and i don't know what the fourth one is going to be i think it's around the corner yeah it seems like 
with social media you you never know in fact uh, me and my friend who's like almost become a monk now we keep mm-hmm. talking about uh, how is india changing and lot of people who want to go outside india hmm. Hmm. Uh, crib about india or things like that right so he puts it very nicely he says that after say 150 or 200 years mm-hmm. where the british partied in india like imagine your house if a party happened for the entire night and yeah. in the morning if you see it's all mess yeah. someone has puked someone has put the sure. wrappers here and there and first i think first one hour it would be vacuuming and cleaning and stuff like that yeah. so if you compare that to hmm. india hmm. it's like 150 or 200 years of british raj and, and everything was disrupted yeah and now it's like 50 years you are just cleaning maybe now next 50 years you'll be doing some True. which is also been seen as well right True. so yeah. yeah i mean that's that's a very interesting way to put it yeah. because yeah now is probably the time to do your own expression yeah, yeah. so a lot of uh, at least and what has become of because of the social media like, there are a lot of eco chambers which are created yeah. you resonate with what you are doing and then you just keep Absolutely. following on the same lines Absolutely. and you don't actually explore the other facets but yeah fortunately with audio gain i'm <laughs> Let's see where we go. I mean, you're doing a great job. <laughs> right? it's, it's really fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Ashwini, last uh, uh, part of the conversation, which yeah. I wanted to speak about elephant. Mm-hmm. So, uh, can you uh, tell us what were the, uh, like you briefly touched upon, but if you can elaborate on what were the challenges when you started elephant. Okay. Second is, uh, what are the key projects that you do and how can people participate in that? Mm-hmm. and. uh maybe audio gain can help to reach few more people mm-hmm. and uh, contribute there and uh, lastly this year uh elephant turned 30 right yeah we just so, turned 30, 32 yeah. two days ago oh, wow that's actually i should have released it <laughs> yeah so yeah first what were the early challenges for elephant design so you know now we and, look- and what i want to uh, highlight here is that even audio gain is not a agency or a studio but right. it's in its early stage right yeah. so i face some hurdles similarly sure. a lot of people are getting into podcasting people are getting into yeah. different avenues of bringing some impact right. at their level at yeah. different yeah. levels right yeah. so i'm sure at an abstract level the challenges will remain the same true so so if i, I can, mean any time you want to do something new that has not been done abundantly before there's been no path before mm. there is going to be a challenge uh, but uh so i'd like to say two things one is that you know sometimes ignorance is bliss mm-hmm. so i don't think we had any idea as 22 23 year olds in 1989 what challenges lay ahead uh so as i also said expectations were very very low so it wasn't like we were going to be flushed with funds there was no concept of outward funds or any such thing for a design a consultancy but early challenges and i can we or i can both laugh at it now because i think one of the biggest challenge we faced first was uh, forming the company we went to a ca because uh, we had learned professional practice at nid and we said we want to form this company we went to the ca and we said uh, here is the idea and this is the company we want to do so guess what the ca says and i'm talking about shukravar pet 1989 he looks at all of us and he says uh, i think we should do partnership hmm so we said okay what is the other option he said private limited so we said why not i mean we were equally you know ignorant to both so we said why not private limited and why a partnership what's the difference and what's the reason so he said because uh, you know dissolving a private limited is very difficult <laughs> partnership can be dissolved pretty easily <laughs> so that was the beginning you know mm. so there was no faith that a, a business like this is ever going to run mm. so our own ca was as encouraging as this is <laughs> second one we went to the bank we had a project already and we were going to receive money so we were told that as a business you need to open a current account so we went to a bank bank manager is very intrigued you know these young bunch of people comes and says want to open a current account so he said he'd like to meet which is a rare thing it seems in those days bank managers used to be like kings and you know they wouldn't meet so we went inside his cabin and he says uh, so what do you do like what are you going to do so we said design we are designers and we've started this consultancy so he said why do you need a current account so we said because we are a business and businesses are supposed to have uh, you know current accounts yeah. 
he said i don't think you're going to need so much you know current account is good if there are a lot of transactions <laughs> so <laughs> that was the second one so you can what i'm trying to tell you is there was no faith mm. at all i think the biggest challenge or the biggest support to any new business can be that people show faith in what you're doing people trust you to do what you're doing and encourage you to do what you're doing so i think that was the biggest challenge that nobody believed and this starts right from nid to pune uh, nobody believed that this thing can work mm. uh, for various reasons and i won't blame them now because maybe it was you know they were right yeah. and it's not like we did anything to prove anyone wrong or prove anything at all we were doing something because we enjoyed being with each other and doing design and that's it uh, getting a phone was very difficult in those days it took us i think a year to get a phone yeah so all so kinds like of five uh, year waiting time sometimes yeah, yeah and you know why we got it in one year because our first project got us some foreign exchange and we realized that there is some category which under which you can get a phone early mm-hmm. if you have earned some foreign exchange uh, not withstanding <laughs> current account or whatever account and after we gained that whatever foreign exchange we went to the telephone exchange filled a new form and they gave it to us in a few months so yeah i mean these were the you know now we laugh at them and we say what is nobody even understands what's a landline mm. so not getting one phone for one year is like who can comprehend what it means but uh, i think uh, more than that what really was challenging was to tell anybody how will design help mm. why should somebody design why should somebody hire a designer to do anything at all because design makes a positive difference is a fact probably discussed today but is still not proved in terms of numbers hmm. despite the 30 40 50 years of design in india we don't have case studies which prove through numbers that before design and after design this is the difference so those days of course there were no case studies today at least we have a few cases where people say yeah design made a difference how much percent of difference probably not known hmm. but i think there was nothing to prove that design could help except our own internal faith mm-hmm. and we were told at nid that good design is profit so that's the only line we used to tell everybody that you know good design is never expensive because whatever you're investing is your capital investment and whatever you will get is your profit which will be more than what you would have uh, got if you didn't do design uh, intervention so i think that was the biggest challenge how to how to sort of convey that design will make a good difference mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, that was the initial challenge i think that's <laughs> really how mm. i would put it yeah. uh, so uh, coming to your second question i think what, mm. uh, which is uh, any key projects uh, which have impacted or you were referring to the chi- uh, the old age problem which you are mm-hmm. trying to do mm-hmm. similarly on those lines uh, any any uh note were the <laughs> projects uh, which elephant <laughs> so, so i i think one is that when you're trying to do a social impact project the best thing is to not talk about it sure. but uh, <laughs> no I, this is not obviously like now you know that i am yeah, not yeah but but i'll tell you a philosophy we have about uh, social impact projects and that is why we managed to do them and continue to do them and i'll tell you a few of the uh, names as well so about uh, 10 or 12 years ago uh, rockefeller foundation had convened a workshop at their uh, campus in italy on design for social impact and they actually invited about 15 designers from around the world and uh, i happened to be invited there and uh, over two or three days i think we discussed how designers can actually help social impact projects and not many designers were coming forward hmm. so what was the reason what is the way in which we can involve more designers in social impact this is what rockefeller was interested in knowing and i was we were one of the couple of the few uh, people from emerging countries the rest were all from uh, developed, developed world from europe and us and so on so uh, along the way we figured a lot of methods and processes on how things could happen better but one thing that we all came out with which was we all took three pledges mm-hmm. and we said this is what we'll implement in our everyday life so the first pledge and i think that's the most relevant one for any of us or anyone who's listening everybody wants to do good but where do you begin you know the world is full of very large problems like world hunger oil spillage in oceans you know i mean fossil fuels getting over these are very large problems yeah so i was talking about these uh, so world is full of big problems right so where do you begin you know what is what is the way what is the first step 
so the first pledge that uh, i took was that you know no problem is small or big to solve so you you have to begin at your backyard our backyards are full of problems so through design if we can solve even a smallest of problems it's worth it even if you make improvement in one person's life using design or design thinking it's worth it hmm. nothing is big or small we are not doing it for getting nobel prizes we are doing it for making a positive difference right so that was my first pledge that start at the backyard you know look at your backyard problems uh, second was that see we are a commercial organization i mean we have people working for us we do commercial projects we get fees are paid to us we have to pay salaries so it's a commercial venture uh but every commercial project if you start looking for an opportunity to ride something which impacts positively mm. there is an opportunity if you look mm. you know so the most commercial project will also provide you probably one tiny opportunity to do something better which impacts which has a social impact mm. beyond the commercial impact if you are able to find that and tell that uh, client that beyond what we are doing for you which we are going to do really well mm. we can also do this and it will have a social impact are you willing to look at it mm. almost no client in the world will say no mm. because everybody actually wants to do good there is dearth of ideas or there is dearth of time or there is a myth that there is dearth of resources mm. you know there are resources and people can spend those mm. Uh, but sometimes they don't have ideas given to them at the right time hmm. so we said maybe not 100% of the projects that we do but at least a sizable number of projects where there is an opportunity that can be identified and we can ride on it hmm. and tell the client that let's do this beyond this uh, so that's the second pledge that we will piggy back on a commercial project to do some social impact wherever possible is it like the crm thing no it's it so in those days there was no crm being discussed mm-hmm, okay mm-hmm. Uh, uh sorry uh i mean i'm sure people were doing some good stuff mm-hmm. but it wasn't like a compulsory spend some of your uh, uh what your resources on doing good mm-hmm. uh, but i'll just give you an example so in those days we were working a lot on some procter and gamble projects and they also had an initiative called shiksha mm-hmm. which was for school children and we managed to ladder up a few ideas around that shiksha initiative along with the projects that we were working on and it sailed through really well and we were able to impact uh, through those projects and that sort of gave us the confidence that mm. you go to any corporate who's for profit uh, also wants to do good you mm-hmm. know so then we of, of course did a few initiatives with britannia where they even went on to fi- uh, form britannia nutrition foundation which was also one of the ideas that came through brainstorming along with them that what is the manner in which they could do social impact work so this was another big success uh, so there were many such uh, possibilities and we pushed wherever it was possible mm-hmm. so that was my second pledge and the third pledge is doing well by doing good okay mm. so there is this belief that if you are into social impact work there is no way that you are going to do well commercially and that's a that's a myth mm-hmm. right i mean a lot of people have proved that now yeah. in the recent times social impact uh, doesn't mean a jhola and you know khadi kurta and mm. running in under the sun it also means many other positive things so that was the third one that we try and find opportunities try and whatever you are doing do good mm. so don't just by not doing anything negative is also creating a social impact Correct. so that's really how we look at uh, doing anything at elephant mm-hmm. and and if people have to contribute or join you guys volunteer uh so <laughs> that's a difficult one because we don't have like formal initiatives okay. as such mm-hmm. so like i said along the way every project that forms an opportunity so uh, right now it's within the team itself but there are a lot of uh doing good kind of organizations that approach us so it's not possible to work with all of them but mm-hmm. we do work with some of them uh and like i said backyard we even worked with baudhan manch i mean they came to us and said you are located in baudhan baudhan nagri manch is actually uh, just a bunch of uh, community that lives around there and they said we want to we want to create posters for segregation of uh, wet waste and dry waste mm-hmm. so can you help us and we said of course i mean this is exactly what we would do mm. because this is a backyard problem 
the positive impact of that whatever that is will be visible right away and it will also benefit us mm-hmm. so why would we not do something like this mm-hmm. and it's small okay. and you will never see it making headlines anywhere mm-hmm. but it actually made a difference and that makes us feel good right mm-hmm. so that's doing good doing yeah, well yeah, both of it yeah so if anybody wants to work on any of this i mean within the elephant team it's it's voluntary again mm-hmm. so cool cool um <laughs> uh, so yeah last concluding uh, mm-hmm. line first of all like congratulations for turning 30 and uh, like it's a media type question but how does it feel <laughs> and uh, what's the future with elephant design So how does it feel is very difficult to say in one or two lines or sentences but I think one word I would say and I I am not uh, going to mince words I mean, we feel very proud mm-hmm. that we believe we made design in India happen and I think that's a great feeling because yeah it's almost like nothing of this scale this consistency uh, this persistence perseverance in design field uh, had happened before though that was not the intention mm-hmm. uh, we kept running the way we loved running but uh, we turned around and saw that not many people were following mm. unfortunately uh, so proud is the feeling now at 30 and there is a bit of a concern also i think uh, because design as a profession has not grown as much as it should have grown mm. any profession for 30 years 40 50 years if it's around in a country it should have seen a very different kind of growth it should have actually been a mainstream profession but it has not happened and it's time to examine why and that's also one of the reasons why uh, not just me but many of us in elephant spend time to go out and talk about what we do how we do we open out our processes we open out our case studies and we say this is what is designed let's not create mysteries around it mm. let's demystify let's make it open and simple and transparent design is not some fancy word it's something that's actually going to help all of us yeah. so that's that's another thing the concern is also there mm. i really would have liked to see design as a profession being far bigger and more impacting than it is today mm. so, i did one interview with uh, professor anirudh joshi mm-hmm. from idc yeah. and he mentioned uh, those were like really rough figures and again two years back but uh, what he said was that uh, in india as we need like for 10 people you need one doctor just hmm, an example hmm, hmm, hmm. similarly you need x person hmm. for one designer hmm. right for one designer and x person x right community yeah. yeah so he said like we may have, have around 20 to 30000 designers hmm. and probably we need million true yeah, true yeah. very true so so that has not happened and yeah. it's very difficult for that to happen because even though there are so many design institutes coming up hmm. there aren't enough design teachers hmm. you know so the problem is not just of building uh you know constructing institutes or building campuses mm-hmm. the problem is much bigger which is getting faculty that can actually create good designers and on top of that well learned faculty yes, as well yes faculty is is the biggest uh, yeah. challenge right yeah. now so i think but it will get there hopefully mm-hmm. million i don't know but i think <laughs> yeah. we should be getting to a few lakh at least mm-hmm. no but overall this is a separate audio game altogether education and design hopefully i'm meeting uh, dheeman panchal tomorrow okay great and uh, great. i'm going to talk to him about great yeah so dheeman was a professor at nid when we were studying and you know we we have a great regard for him mm-hmm. and great regard for the energy he displays even now yeah which is very remarkable very inspiring mm-hmm. uh so so the other thing that uh, 30 years uh, the other question which even before you ask i think i need to answer this which is what next hmm uh so we've come this far but uh, you know there's a very interesting saying which is you didn't come this far to come this far mm-hmm. okay so you came this far because you had to actually get somewhere else which okay. is far ahead so i think we have to make that happen we have to make an indian design company uh respected globally mm-hmm. and i think that's uh, that's going to happen only if we do positive impact projects within india and emerging markets uh and there is a lot to do and i hope we get to do a lot of that as well uh the other thing is the the new front line is ready at elephant mm. so the old front line has to take a back seat and the new one has to come in the new ideas have to come in we have to see what is their vision because it cannot only be the founders vision that can you know see a company go forever mm. 
सो इफ वी मेड समथिंग विच इज बिल्ड टू लास्ट इट विल लास्ट ओनली इफ न्यूअर विजन गेट एडिड टू इट जस्ट लाइक द एलिफेंट स्टोरी ऑफ ब्लाइंड पीपल एंड बिग पिक्चर राइट सो या आई थिंक दैट्स द नेक्स्ट all right all right i'm like just given the time a podcast is supposed to be otherwise this conversation <laughs> can go on and on uh okay i think this is a good note to end this obviously sure. ashwini there's lots more to talk about i would like to have you again on audio again to sure love to come uh, discuss more bits about maybe we can brainstorm on what we can uh document sure. and share with sure. uh, budding designers sure and it was really wonderful talking thank to you thank you so much thank i had a great time once, chatting yeah. with you thank you all the again. best to audio gyan yeah and always there for you thank you thank you and that's it from today's gyan session catch us on itunes savan stitcher or any podcasting app you use do rate us on itunes and follow us on twitter facebook and instagram stay tuned for more gyan on audiogyan.com till then bye As we watch the suburban garden gnome carefully, carefully without disturbing it, we notice that it moves like not at all. It's inanimate and utterly without brain function. But despite that, when a garden gnome hears about how Geico not only saves people money but also gives them access to licensed agents 24/7 online and over the phone, it's clear to them you should switch. Because yes, switching to Geico is a no-brainer. But on second thoughts, maybe don't watch garden gnomes too carefully. People might talk.